can be excused to go to kids' own worship. Um, just a note about next Sunday, it is Baptism Sunday. We will be down at Reeds Park, as far as I know, unless the weather changes and the river changes. Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of things that could change that, but we will try to make sure, that we will make sure you all know. It will be in your emails. It'll be on the Facebook page. So if you don't get either of those, make sure you double check with us. So in case so you want to know where we are, um, in case we get more rain, <laughs> I guess that would be the big thing right now. Um, and uh, we're also, we're doing the entire service there, and we're also having a potluck. So please bring stuff for a picnic potluck. There are um, outlets there, so we will be plugging in some things like crock pots and things when we get there. Um, and the, the baptism is for any person that, we talked about it last Sunday a lot, what baptism means. Um, so if you want to be baptized next Sunday, please let us know. Please let me know so we can get that taken away. Um, children, if you want to go on downstairs, Miss, Di Miss Denise is down there waiting for you, I think. So there we go. <laughs> All of them. There we go. All right. So that's next week. Um, I think that's pretty much it for right now. So we're in a series called, Why Do We Do That? Why do we do baptism? That's what we talked about last week. And there are, you know, as we think about life and the things that happen in life, there are many reasons that we have to obey things, right? There's a, that's why obedience is necessary. There are, we obey traffic laws, we follow the laws, you know, we follow our doctor's orders, we follow, we, when the pharmacist tells us how to take a medicine, we tend to listen to them and do what he says or she says. We have, you know, if you're in a sport, there are rules. You know, if you're playing a game and there's no rules, it doesn't work very well. Um, I was at, uh, Connor got judged yesterday in dog obedience. There are rules. There's a list of things he's got to follow and do to get a ribbon. And we, we do that with a lot of different things. We have to have a license to hunt. We have to have a license to fish. We have to have a license to use the trails for the DNR and go ride horses. There are things that we do to obey the laws. Even the game Kings in the Corner, which we end up playing a lot on Wednesday nights, has rules. So why do we need rules? Why are they important? Why are there laws? Why are those things out there for us? Uh, this is discussion. You can answer these ones. Keep order. Keep, order. keep us safe. Oh. Huh? To keep it fair as much as possible. Yeah. Pretty much all, to know what we're, yeah, to have, to have direction and guidance. No, I should have kept the kids up a little bit longer. But why, you know, if you ask a child, why does mom and dad have rules? And as parents, what do we tell them? Because, no. <laughs> to keep you safe. One more. Why do we have rules? Why do we, why do, why do we tell our children? To, why do we want to keep them safe? Because to teach them. There we go. There's a four-letter word I was waiting for. Because we love them. Because we love them. We want to keep them safe and taken care of. And we don't want them to get hurt. We don't want them to run out in the street. We don't want them to, you know, to play in the playground, not in this, you know, other places. So that's why we have rules, and that's why we obey them, because we know they're good for us. The main reason there are laws is for the safety and well-being of people. God, too, gave us statutes and laws and, and rules. They're, they're for our safety. They're because he loves us. They're because he wants us to follow him and to be in a, in a good place to grow in him. So we are in week two of why do we do that. Last week, we talked about um, baptism. And it's not just the practice of South Troy. It's for the church universal. Why, why, we, why do we do baptism? And that's why we look at God's word, because it's the same for everybody. It's God's word. It's the truth. And last week, we answered that question, why do we have baptism? Well, we have baptism to enjoy the full measure of God's grace in our lives. Baptism is a work of God's grace in our lives. 
We learn that it is covenantal. It is a promise. It is a new beginning between us and God. It is a testimony where we say to others and to the people around us that we are standing in our faith and that we believe, just like in that video, that, that we believe what Jesus said, and that he is God and that his grace covers all our sins, his gift. And it is a grace gift from God. Jesus instituted it to show us that when we, when we go under, when we go under the water, we are saying, I'm dying to my sins and I'm dying to this world and I'm living for God. When we rise up, to do that. So this week, we're asking the question, why do we have communion? Because it's communion Sunday. thought it would be a good week to do that one. <laughs> and so a couple of, you know, as you think about it, it's not just because it's the second Sunday of the month. That's not why we have communion. Jesus is the one that set this up. He took what they were already doing at Passover, and he established a new covenant a new sacrament, that evening, we often call it the Lord's Supper, or we call it communion. And during that last supper with his disciples, the Passover celebration, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it, and he passed it to his disciples to have them break off a piece and pass it around. And he said, this is my body. This is my body. And they pass it around and he ate it. And we're going to read that account in just a minute. He concluded that feast by singing a hymn. And then they went out to the Mount of Olives or the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And then the evening went as predicted. Judas betrayed him. He was brought before the Sanhedrin. He had a mock of a trial. And the next day he's crucified. That all happened in that time period. And you can read the accounts of that in the Gospels, in Matthew 26, or Luke 22, or Mark 14, or John 13. In fact, we're going to look at Luke 22 this morning. And that's where we're going to start today. So Luke 22, we're going to look at Jesus's, how Jesus set up the Lord's Supper for us. in Luke 22, verses 14 to 20. It says, when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. That's, that was the first Lord's Supper, the first communion. And we see it here where Jesus is breaking the bread. He's, he's taking, passing the juice around, the wine around. And he's sharing this. And he says, this is a new covenant. Keep that in mind as we continue this morning. It's a new covenant bought with his blood. He gave his blood for this covenant. And we see it mentioned again in the book of Acts. We see it mentioned in the book of 1 Corinthians we see it over and over again that the, the church, the people of God, shared, set, shared the Lord's Supper together. In Luke 2, 42 to, 42 to 47, we see it as, you know, this is the new church. Luke, you know, Acts 2 is right after Pentecost. It's a baby church. It's, they're just getting started. In verses 42 to 47, said, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity." 
all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship daily those who were being saved. And then if you go farther on in Acts and Acts 20, we see it again. In fact, it's during a time when the Apostle Paul is preaching and a gentleman falls out the window, but we don't get to that part in this section. But verse, verse 7 of chapter 20 says, On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. And then verse 11, after, after Eutychus got rose up from the dead, from a dead sleep, from the dead, it says in um, verse 11, it says, Then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. So we see them practicing the Lord's Supper, the communion, from the very beginnings of the church. So when the church got together, they partook in communion or the Lord's Supper, and it was meant to build community among believers. It wasn't just a tradition. It wasn't just a ritual they were going to do. It was something to build fellowship. It was something that they did together as a body of believers. It was meant to build community, and Jesus was eager when he started it to spend time with his disciples. They were sitting down for having Passover, and then he instituted this new commandment, this new sacrament, and wanted them to find an, a way to share in the faith and to build a new sacrament, a new testament of what God was doing, a new covenant. And as we looked at the Acts of the Apostles, we see that they continue that practice. The disciples lead the way in all of these things. In Acts 2, it was the apostles, the disciples that got together, and then all the people Imagine that first church. I mean, they said they're added to their numbers daily. There was like 3,000 the first day. That's a lot of communion. That's a lot of Lord's Supper. And they get together and they share this together in each other's homes. And they practice it every time they meet. Now, Paul wrote about it because he had some concerns because by the time, sadly, they get to the Corinthian church, it had already started to get, have some problems which was really sad. Um, as you look at 1 Corinthians 11, Paul includes a statement that we don't find in the Gospels as well as we look at what Paul was writing. And he said, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the blood and body of the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon themselves. By the time the Corinthian church was having communion, they were making it kind of a party. They were making it pretty, you know, oh, we got to have we got to have communion. So they were eating all the bread and drinking all the wine and basically getting drunk and getting fat and not making sure everybody even had food. They had, start, they had taken what Jesus had given them, and they had abused it. They had, they had started to treat it in a way that is very disrespectful to Jesus, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, every time you take this, remember what I did for you. This is my body, broken not something to be taken lightly, not something to be taken for granted, not something to just shove in your face and say, oh, we got, you know, we checked this list off. I got communion done today. I did, you know, I, get, I got everything finished that I need to do. And that's what Paul was criticizing, the, the, you know, chastising them, saying, you need to get back to the heart of the matter. You need to get back to Jesus. That's what communion is about. It's about coming together and remembering the, that what Jesus did. So before we go any farther, I want to contrast that account and read a little bit farther down in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 11, verse 20 to 34, and just to hear the difference from what Jesus said and what they were actually doing there. And I didn't have that one marked. All right. So starting at verse 20 to 34. Oh, actually, I want us all to look it up. That's why I didn't have it marked. 
Um, it's in this Bible. It's in your pew Bibles. It won't be on the screen, but it's on page 930 and 31. So if you want to follow along, it will be in your pew Bibles. Let's see if I can. So we're going to start at verse 20 to verse 34. It says, so then, when you come together, it is not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter, for I receive from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is broke, and this is my body. I'm sorry. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now we might want to ask, you know, what does it mean to partake in an to partake of it in an unworthy manner? And it just it's when we disregard the true meaning of why we're doing it. When we just treat it like a habit that we're doing because we have to. Or when we're or we think everybody else is doing it, so I should do it. But God says we're supposed to look on the inside and and see what's going on in our lives and get remember what's going on, that Jesus paid the price for our salvation by giving his life for us, by dying a terrible death on the cross, by having a broken body, not that his bones were broken, but that they were he was beaten to a pulp, almost beyond recognition. And his blood poured down all over the place where he got scourged and hanging on the cross. He gave his self totally and completely. And that's what we're to remember when we take the bread and the wine or juice as we do here as Wesleyans. And when we take those things, that's what we're remembering. And we're celebrating, too, that we're a body of believers that we have. We can celebrate that Jesus did that for us. And that we can come together as a body of believers. Because we couldn't do that before, before that. We've seen the contrast in the scriptures. We see that, you know, Jesus is beginning where it was a time of celebration, where it was a time of sharing. He said, I want to share this meal with you. And then we see what Paul said, what it had already come to within 50 years, how it had already changed so quickly. And so it shows us as a church, and it's a good reminder that as believers, we need to take that time to pause and think as the elements are being distributed, as we're sharing in communion, what it's really all about. And it's a good, good remembrance for all of us. I, as a confirmation student um, at, at Trinity long ago, I remember Pastor Gertner said, when, you're, when you've picked up that elements and before you take communion, you need to sit in that pew and think. You need to pray and talk to God. And I've never forgotten that. And I thought, you know, that's what we need to do as believers, to always sit there and pause. Because communion is a time to pause and to introspect a bit. Now, I want to focus on seven reasons that we do take communion and continue to build on that as we, we grow our faith journey as believers. So one, first, a memorial, it's a memorial to Jesus' love and sacrifice, like I said. We're remembering what Jesus did. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. 
where every time we take it, we're to remember Jesus. One reason Christians take communion is to remember the sacrifice. Communion honors the death of Jesus Christ and reflects on the magnitude of his love. What great love he had, how much it cost him to love us and to love his Father in obedience. Secondly, to proclaim the gospel. When we receive communion, we are declaring our faith. Every time believers take communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we declare his resurrection. Because it didn't stop at the cross. It didn't stop in the grave. It stops three days later when Jesus rose from the dead. We take communion as well because we want to acknowledge the new covenant. Jesus said, this is a new covenant. The old is gone. The Old Testament where you have to sacrifice a lamb, where you have to come to the temple and do all these rituals and things. I've just taken care of that. I am the lamb that has taken away the sin of the world. You believe on me. I have answered that sacrifice and taken care of it for you. So now we have that in Jesus Christ. That's what we're acknowledging when we, we acknowledge that new covenant. And we're also uniting as a body of believers. Christ instituted that. He said he wanted the disciples to do that together as a body of believers. That's why the church did it all the time, because they were coming together as believers and saying, we are sharing in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ today. We are remembering together. And that makes us stronger as believers, and it encourages us, gives us a family bond, because we have communion. That's, you can do that when you go to any church that, that's a Christian church that has communion. You're sharing together what Jesus Christ has done. Number five, you're partaking in spiritual nourishment. You're taking communion strengthens your faith. When we take communion, it strengthens our faith. The elements of the bread and the wine are symbolic of spiritual food and drink. We're sharing it together and feeding on it together, and it nurtures our souls, and it fills us with God's grace because we're, just, we're remembering how valuable, how much God loves us, and, and accepting that as a believer. We're also anticipating Jesus' return. When we partake in communion, we're, look for, we're looking forward with hope because Jesus said, I'm not going to do this again until I come back. So every time we take communion, we're remembering that Jesus is coming back and that one day we will all be together at, it's going to be called the Great Feast of the Lamb, together, and it's in Revelations 19, 7 to 9. It says, let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride, and that's the church, has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb, and he added, these are the true words that come from God. So every time you take communion, you're remembering that Jesus is coming back, and one day you're going to sit with him at the great banquet, celebrating heaven, celebrating his return. And lastly, it's a time to examine ourselves. It's a time for self-reflection. Paul urges believers in 1 Corinthians to examine themselves before partaking the Lord's Supper. Because he said, he was pretty, pretty strong about it. He said, if you partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, you're sinning. You need to make sure you're, you're, you believe in Jesus Christ, for one thing. That's the main thing when you take communion. You need to believe that it really is about him. And then there's other ways to do it unworthy. Having, you know, um, having something against somebody else, um, having a place where you need to repent, there's a number of ways, or just treating it like, you know, it's no big deal. I could care less. I'm just doing this because my parent next to me is doing it or my friend next to me is doing it. I don't want everybody to look at me if I don't take it. You know, those are the ways that we can take it unworthily. Just forgetting that it is a holy encounter with Jesus Christ. When we observe communion, we're encouraged to approach it with reverent fear, reverent and time and holiness 
within our hearts and our minds to be open to what God is doing and to be ready to receive what he wants to say to us. It's significant. It's a sacred moment of fellowship together as a body of believers and with Jesus Christ. Communion is a holy encounter. Taking communion is a profound moment where spiritual and physical intersect. I like how Jesus gives us these rituals, gave us the sacrament. He gave us something tangible to hold on to. He didn't say, just remember my sacrifice. He didn't say, just remember that I died on the cross. He said, this is my body. Every time you take this bread and take a piece of it, it represents me and my body that was broken for you. He said, take and eat it. And he says to take that and remember. So he gave us something physical to hold on to, something that we could chew on, literally. And then he took the, ju- he took the wine and the cup and he passed it and he said, this is my blood. That had to freak out those disciples the first time, saying this is my blood. But it's a representation of what Jesus was going to do. He knew that his blood was going to be shed on that cross. And he said, I'm dying. I'm going to die. I want you, every time you drink this, remember. But he gave us physical things. And I love that because it helps me to remember. But it helps us all to remember when we have those tangible things to, to focus on what Christ has done. And it, communion offers us an opportunity to connect with the reality of Christ's sacrifice. It gives us the opportunity to celebrate the new covenant that Jesus established with his blood. It gives us opportunity to strengthen our faith. How much, how often do we often need? We need that boost, that reminder. It also gives us the opportunity to unite with fellow believers. I mean, you can take communion at home, and we did during COVID. We did it online together at home. But, you know, coming together as a body of believers, you feel like family. No matter how big the family might be. I think, keep thinking of that early church when it said there was like 3,000. That would have been a big communion. But still then, they were a body of believers coming together and sharing it. It gives us the opportunity to to anticipate the return of Jesus. And that was kind of a new one to me as I was continuing and reading it. That That's right. It does remind us to be remembering that one day we'll be sharing this meal again. But it'll be with a victorious Jesus Christ coming back to reestablish. And that's awesome. It's something to look forward to. And it gives us time to introspectively align our lives with God's will. It gives you a time during that time when you're holding those elements and praying to say, if the Holy, give the, let the Holy Spirit give you a nudge. You know, speak to your heart. Say, you know, if, the, if there's something you have that you need to take care of with the Lord, that's a great time to get her done. And then it's a time to just, when you take that, the, the communion elements and, and receive them, you're saying, you're committing to that. You're saying, I'm going to do it. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Or whatever it is you had to take care of. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to call that person as soon as I get out of church today. And I, you know, you're making a promise. You're doing that thing. And then as you take communion, you're, kind of, you're making a promise. You're making a covenant with God. Another statement Paul made that's not included in the Gospels is, for whenever you drink and eat this cup, you're proclaiming, I just talked about that, proclaiming when Jesus is coming back. Jesus himself used those elements. And you know, these things don't last long. This bread ain't going to last long. It doesn't, after you cook unleavened bread, it doesn't last very long. It isn't very tasty. But it's something that helps us to remember and gives us something to use in our hands. And that new covenant replaced that old covenant as we had talked about the time of sacrifice and those things in, that we can read about in Hebrews. And then the sacri- sacrificial system is no longer needed. And if you go to Hebrews 9, 26 to 28, it says, but now once for all time, he, Jesus, has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death and sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes the judgment, so also Christ offered his life once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, 
but to bring salvation to all who eagerly wait for him. What a promise. That's the new covenant we're celebrating, that Jesus took care of it once for all time. And we never have to do those things that they were doing before. Jesus offered himself as that sacrifice and added reason to celebrate as we share the Lord's Supper today. The Lord's Supper, a Christian communion, is a remembrance of what Christ did for us and a celebration of what we receive as a result of that sacrifice. So as we enter communion this morning, I do want us to share it as family. You aren't going to have to eat this piece of bread that I've been playing with, but we, I do have unleavened bread for us today. We're going to pass two baskets, and we're going to ask that um, one on each side, and that you, learn, that you pass like nice people, and make sure everybody gets the basket and gets a piece of bread out of there. And then the usher, our usher will, um, our ushers, one, I guess we'll only need, I guess we still need two ushers just to make sure that the bread baskets keep going, and then one to help the, the, the juice to go around. But as we enter it, just like the early church, as they're passing the bread and the juice, I want you to be thinking. I want you to, to be praying, talking to God. If there's something you need to work out with God, take that time to do it. You'll have some time as, as Eric plays the music for us and, and gives us some background there. And as we pray together, um, hopefully that'll help you to understand why we do communion so much better this today. So as we take it together. So as the ushers come up. Dear Father God, thank you for giving us the sacrament. A lot of times we just take this as kind of for granted because many of us have been believers for a while. And Lord, we just, we do it because that's what you do in church. And there's nothing technically wrong with that, but sometimes we forget the great sacrifice you made. Sometimes we forget how important it is to take time to think on it, to remember it. And sometimes we forget how important it is to do this as a body of believers, a family of God, to share it together. Thank you that we can share it together today. Thank you that you have instituted this for us. And Lord, we ask you to bless these elements and help them to bring us to that place in our hearts and in our lives where we truly celebrate your coming again as well. In your name, the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. Amen.
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat. that this is my body, which is being broken for you. And then he took the cup, lifted it toward heaven. He said, this is my blood, the new covenant that is coming for you. Take and drink. Dear Jesus, we are so unworthy of what you have done for us. There is no way we can ever, ever pay back the great gift, the great sacrifice that you gave for us. Yet we come together today to remember your sacrifice, to remember how much you love us, to remember that you obeyed your Father all the way to death on the cross. Lord, help us to reflect that grace. Help us to reflect our faith help us to continue to grow as a body of believers totally and completely committed to you and committed to one another to lift one another up in you to encourage one another even more as the day of your coming back approaches oh lord help us to be faithful fill us with your spirit fill us with your body and your blood today and help us to truly sense your presence in all that we say and all that we do we thank you, Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.